Howard. Uh, it's, I've never been to one of these before. It's great. It's amazing. So, uh, so yeah, he's going to go uphill. Actually, it's, that's a lie. It's going to go downhill when you see this graph. This graph is essentially a graph that tells us that uh, for every year of our life, our chances of dying obviously increase. But it's actually even worse than that. It's called the gompertz makem rule of human mortality. And basically what it says is that um, every eight years, our chances of dying um, doubles. It doubles. So when you get 30, things get bad from 30 onwards, essentially. Um, so I started a kind of a, a, a quest, I suppose. I, I spent the last few years looking at whether this holds across the rest of zoology, whether or not all animals sort of, sort of have to suffer this curse of mortality, this curse of, you know, upward struggle, I suppose. I mean, clearly some animals don't seem to mind a little bit of death. You know, you think of mayflies, you think of dragonflies, you think of damselflies. These are animals that live as larvae for a couple of years, and then quite happily they will breed, obviously, until they die. You must have heard of the echinus mouse, some of you. It's a marsupial family of mice. And they literally invest everything in gonads, everything. They rubbish off their immune system, and they, as they're rotting, they're still trying to have sex. So they clearly, no probs for them, a bit of death. But across life's tree, is this a pattern that we see the whole way across? I was like, when I started on this project, I was like, no way. You know, we're all fixed. You live, you die, and that's about it. But actually, that's not the case at all. I was absolutely amazed that you take something like a, a brook trout. You take a brook trout from Europe and you put it in a, a lake in North America without predators, and they're living like, you know, within 20 years, twice as long, sometimes three times longer. Their lifespan shifts. This thing, a pearl mussel larvae, it lives in the gills of fish, and it injects a peptide into the fish. It allows the fish to live a year longer, so the little larvae can live within its host for a longer period. So it's actually manipulating the lifespan of another animal. Hydra, you know, one of the most common animals in the world, is in puddles and ponds and stuff like that. You know, stem cells have an infinite, you know, capacity for regeneration. And this animal is everywhere. The C. elegans, it's like the fruit fly of worms. All these animals, they're, they're, they're flexible lifespans. You starve this worm if you would want to starve a worm. It lasts months. Feed it, it breeds, it dies within weeks. So this flexibility, we see it kind of, we see it all the way through nature. I was absolutely gobsmacked. We see it all the way through nature. Birds should be absolutely pulverized by free radicals. They metabolize three times faster than most mammals, and they're still around. They live, you know, some pigeons might live 25, 30 years. Like naked, naked mole rats are, you know, they are absurd animals. But they can live absurdly long. You know, an animal like that might live 30 years. It's completely riddled with free radical damage. Its cells are aging and it still lives on. And it doesn't get cancer. There is a whole host of these strange animals out there that we're only just starting to realise. You must have heard of the immortal jellyfish as well. A jellyfish that is like no other. It produces like little sexual swimmers. They land on the bottom and they reverse back into larval form. It's just bizarre. So there was me thinking, wow, you know, lifespan is fixed. We're all stuck with the ages we're given. Lifespan, that's what you get. But actually, it's not the case at all. There are some pound signs here because I realised about halfway through the project that I wasn't alone. I was not alone looking at lifespan in animals like PayPal, uh, Google Ventures. Um, Oracle, they are throwing billions of pounds <laughs> at naked mole rats of all animals. You know, they're throwing millions of pounds at this kind of research, trying to monetize aging, I suppose. The, the industry is currently worth 200 billion pounds, I was shocked to learn. A massive industry, but it could be great. I mean, imagine we could move that graph over. Imagine we could reduce the uh, diseases of old age, squeeze them into the last few years of life instead of ruining the NHS like we are now. It's really exciting. But I kind of got to a point where I'm not sure if it's scary or not, you know, that we're basically allowing people to have the potential to pay to extend their life. I haven't got a pension at the moment. I haven't got a pension. I'm not spending, I'm not working extra to pay for their beautiful retirement that may last another sort of 20, 30 years. And as far as I can kind of see, there isn't this public discussion about this wonderful, massive change in science. And I'm kind of interested in starting that. 
So thank you for having me. If you want to chat to me, give me a shout.